I am Martha Eddy, and I live in New York City, and I'm a somatic movement therapist specializing in developmental movement therapy at the Center for Kinesthetic Education. So in doing somatic movement therapy, I specialize in something called developmental movement therapy, which means that my work has a basis in neuromotor processes how as infants we learn to move and even in utero how we learn to move and how those movement patterns actually inform our older childhood as well as our adulthood. Sensory motor integration is a term that I like to use um, in relationship to a fairly common term used in occupational therapy called sensory integration. And in particular, as a movement therapist that's based in developmental movement therapy, um, we look at neuromotor progression, how babies, both at birth but also in utero, in development, move in relationship to sensory stimulus and the ability to integrate what's going on through the eyes, the ears, even taste and smell is um, an indicator of how we process information. One of the ways that we see how children process information is actually in their movement, how they respond to it. So if someone shuts down in a way it could be because it's too much stimulus and they need time to integrate and work with it. Or if they're really very hyperactive, it's not always because they're excited and curious about the world, but rather that they're overstimulated and they're trying to process it through lots of movement. So we're constantly uh, using a model that says sensory input comes in and there's a need to have motor expression out. We have a theory that's based in early um, child study that happened at the Yale Ch uh, Child Study Center in New Haven, Connecticut in the U.S. that the use of movement is a stimulus to the development of the brain. This is why it's called neuromotor development. So why we're doing some of this support for movement is to also, is, is to bring in movement coordination and efficiency and performance, but it's also to to stimulate parts of the brain. This needs to be researched and studied. The hypothesis right now is based in case studies where we see that certain kids that don't have these patterns are a little sluggish, not just in their movement, but sometimes later in their learning processes. There are children that come in often more around the ages of two and three that appear to be relating differently than other kids and often are undiagnosed as being part of the autistic spectrum. Um, and I'm not sure until we do kind of a full neuromotor evaluation together, on a, a, a neuromotor evaluation with me, but a psycho neuro evaluation with a psychologist, whether um, a label is important in some ways is not significant. Basically, when we're working with children with autism or that where parents are suspecting that there's some behavioral um, delay, we just begin with the same process of, of observing movement. Often we'll see a more rigid spine and a kind of more stubborn um, response to things, less flexibility. We'll see um, a kind of internalization in the moment of panic where you just retreat into some tiny little thing and stimulate instead of relating. There are all the usual indicators like lack of eye contact or what we call shared attention following to a point. Um, and so those are usually where the behavioral issues come in. Sometimes it's also mismatch with um, parent and child or two siblings and it can be something like a child being very much of a mover and the family being much more of an intellectual family and they just are more comfortable with everybody quietly reading and then there's this child that really wants to move 
And there's a tendency to label children like that as hyperactive. And yet until you see that child in the context of other children, that child may just be more of a mover than the family. Or the child may actually have some issues with sensory motor integration. Or the child may have some real attentional issues that need support. Um, I was trained by two pretty amazing women. I mentioned before I studied with an OT, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. I also studied with a physical therapist named Ermgard Barteniev. Each developed their own system of work. One is called Body Mind Centering, the other is Barteniev Fundamentals and Laban Movement Analysis. And I brought them together in my work. As I was working, I also had the privilege of meeting a psychologist and a psychiatrist that specialized with babies and children. One was Judith Kestenberg, so I worked with her as well, and another was Dr. Christine Chris. And uh, Dr. Christine Chris helped to set up a center for evaluation of children as a psychologist in um, the extended community of Harvard. So her program was called Harvard Mind, and she started this in the 50s, and I really love the name of it. Mind stands for Multidisciplinary Institute for Neuropsychological Development. So she was very holistic. This is a long answer to what are attentional issues. Christine Chris felt that very few children actually had attentional problems and they basically are driven by the issue of involvement. So if you're motivated to do something and involved with it, a lot of kids that are actually labeled as, as having attention deficit will demonstrate a complete attention to an activity because they're involved. The question is why they're not involved in school activities that all the other kids are willing to do. And sometimes it is exactly that process of just getting inside the motivation of a child that can shift their attention. Other times they're just different kinds of learners. They may be kinesthetic. Maybe about two years ago, um, a full magazine section of the New York Times that was focused on how boys were having a harder time in school. And in general, there's this sense that between schools being coming more, elementary schools in particular, female-dominated environments, but also um, environments that don't have as much outdoor playtime, that it's, all, it's a kind of um, injustice to kids in general, but particularly hard on boys that have a lot of energy. And they're being labeled as moving around too much, rather than the school seeing the need for children to move in general. Again, I take a cue from the child psychiatrist, Judith Kestenberg, who was wonderful in the sense of understanding that both boys and girls kind of go through the same development of different kinds of rhythms and we all need to suck as babies and we all learn to squirm at some point and we learn to have little tantrums and these are all movement skills. They're part of what I call movement is behavior or behavior is movement. Um, and there's a phase where even little boys love, especially around age four, to rock a doll or a truck or whatever it might be, whatever is acceptable for them in their family to spend time with that rocking movement with. And a lot of caretaking, self-care and care of others. And then there's a phase that is like a lot of jumping and going out, trajectories, and girls have this as well. But it does seem that the balance, and again, I don't know if it's being nurtured by our, our acculturated society, is that the girls will spend more prolonged time in the rocking phases and the boys will spend more time in the jumping and trajectory phases. So that's something worthy of being studied.